I thank PG Department of English, Nesamani Memorial Christian College, Marthandam Kanyakumari, and Cape Comorian Trust India for giving me the chance to chair this session on their International Conference of American Literature. I thank Chief Patron, Patron, Organizing Secretary, Convener, Coordinator, and everyone else who's associated with this event. I congratulate everyone on the successful organization of this event. And I also welcome all the academicians, researchers, scholars, and participants here. I'm looking forward to a scintillating and interesting discussion based on the topics that I have been given and the list of the participants, the eminent scholars that are going to present here. So in this session, uh, I hope all five presenters are already in the session. Yes, ma'am. So without wasting much time, we'll delve straight into the first paper presentation, which is by Dr. Kavita Arya, Senior Assistant Professor, Department of English, Mahatma Gandhi, Kashi Vidya Peet Varanasi. And her title is Flying Home, a Study in Identity Crisis. I request Dr. Kavita to take over. Yes. Thank you, everyone. And good morning to all of you. I'm Kavita Arya, and I'm going to uh, present my paper that Flying Home, which published in 1944, is one of the most appreciated short stories of Ralph Ellison, a famous American novelist and storyteller of the 20th century. The story is set during the World War II and deals with the lifelong ambition and aspirations of a black American young man to defy racism prevalent in the US and prove his ability and efficiency in piloting an airplane like his white counterparts. But while on a test flight in an advanced trainer, he was flying high in the sky around the white world. He gets excited and maneuvers the plane to prove himself, but his maneuver takes a dangerous turn. And as he tries to control the airplane, a buzzard hits the windscreen of his airplane, which crash lands in the field of a white man. He crashes in a farmland in rural Alabama and breaks his ankle. An old black sharecropper Jefferson and his son Teddy save him and take him to the hospital. And this paper examines the social injustice of racial discrimination as seen from the eyes of the black young black pilot and protagonist who suffers from inner conflict because of his loathing for his own folks and his desire of endorsement from the white men and struggles to resolve this conflict. Flying Home was first published in cross section in 1944, a year before Ellison uh, started writing his first novel and masterpiece, Invisible Man, which was published in 1952, while he was serving in the Merchant Marine, it is Ellison's longest short story and not only the last story, but also the story to be used in the title of the collection of Ellison's short stories, Flying Home and Other Stories which published in 1998. It is the story of a young African-American Air Force trainee pilot named Todd, whose long cherished ambition of becoming a pilot crashes along with his plane when he flies into a buzzard on a training flight. As he accidentally crash lands on a field, he is found by an old sharecropper, Jefferson, who along with his son, Teddy, tries to solve his problem and in the process, the injured pilot is confronted to all kinds of reaction and racism. The story is set in the time of World War II, a time when African Americans did not enjoy the same rights as whites. Todd has worked hard all his life to earn a chance to prove that African American could fly a combat plane at the same way as any other, any white militant. Todd 
is the first ever black candidate to be accepted into the Air Force. He is a black pilot, a northerner who belongs to a group of black World War II pilots who trained at the famed Tuskegee Institute, but were only reluctantly deployed by combat mission. So when he is on a routine flight in an advanced training trainer aircraft, it is hit by a bird and brought down to earth. When he awakes from the crash, he discovers that his ankle was broken and he was unable to walk. The place rural Alabama where he has crashed his plane is also important because it was associated with the long history of his ancestors who had toiled under slavery in the plantation of the whites. In fact, during its first test flight in flight training school in Macon country, Alabama, Todd feels so overexcited and nervous that he crashes the plane on a nearby farm. In the height of his excitement and eagerness to prove himself, he went too fast, stalling the plane, which made him lose control. And before he could regain it, he hit a bird and broke the windshield and led to his crash. It was a buzzard which had hit the windshield of the plane and caused the crash to happen. Todd says, the buzzard knocked me back to a hundred years. The pre-crash events has been described as follows, but he had been flying too high and too fast. He had climbed steeply away in exultation, too steeply, he thought. And one of the first rules you learn is that if the angle of thirst is too steep, the plane goes into a spin. And then instead of pulling out of it and going into dive, you let a buzzard panic you, a lousy buzzard. Jefferson, the black sharecropper who rushes to rescue, Todd mentions that in folklore, buzzard feed on the feed horse, uh, horses and eat nothing that is alive and informs that they were in plenty in that area and they were called Jim Crows, that is anti-black. Todd has fallen from the cockpit and is trying to stand up, but he lies in pain with his fractured ankle. Jefferson and his son Teddy rush to save the disoriented pilot, but in the hot and blinding sun, Todd could not make out whether they were black or white. For a moment, an old fear of becoming touched by a white hand seized him. But the language used by Jefferson, you hurt bad, brings the comfort that they are Negroes. He tells Jefferson that he has hurt his ankle. As Jefferson quickly bends and removes his shoes, he feels relief. Jefferson wants to get him to a doctor, but Todd wants to get the plane back to, a to the field before the officers were displeased. But he could not because he was not even able to stand up. Jefferson advises him against making any movement, lest it should get worse and lead to the cutting of his foot. He offers to take him to the nearby town on his ox, but the thought of riding an ox feels taught with disgust. Instead of being in pain, he disliked to ride on ox. Todd has crushed in the farm and of uh, Dabney Graves, a white landowner Jefferson works for. Graves is not very fond of black individuals. And Jefferson asks his son to get Mr. Graves when uh, sorry, while he helps Todd off the plane. Todd has a broken ankle, but he feels no pain in his mind as he despairs over the mistake that will cost not only his career as a pilot, but also many African American jobs and respect. Todd is convinced that his incompetence will be the basis of characterization for all African Americans who wish to join the Air Force. He will never get another chance to fly. Todd's apprehensions that the crash had spoiled his career as a pilot 
may be indirectly associated with the real life incidents in the life of Ralph Ellison. Ellison was admitted to the Tuskegee Institute, the prestigious all black university in Alabama in 1933 because it needed a trumpet player like him in the in its orchestra how it is related to the writer that is what i'm clearing here but later he found that even that all black university was no less class conscious than white institutions generally were ellison had to go to the new york city in the summer of 1936 and settle at ymca on 135th street in harlem than the cultural than the cultural capital of black america to earn experience for his senior year at tuskegee but he could never return to his studies as tuskegee and never become a professional musician todd is aware that american army air force had already been quite discriminatory in respect of the aspiring black pilots and his failure would provide it future for the teeth to reject the black aspirants. Uh, Nita Lalwani in, his, uh, in her scholarly article on flying home puts, in, puts it in the following words, in quote, it is noteworthy that Ellison has taken the content of his story from, the, from an historical event during World War II when Judge William H. Hasty, who served as a civilian aide to Henry L. Stimson, the Secretary of War resigned in 1943 in, pro in protest over that, over what he called the reactionary policies and discriminatory practices of the Army Air Force. Judge Haste commented, the simple fact is that the Air Command does not, need, does not want Negro pilots flying in and out of various fields, eating, sleeping, and mingling with other personnel as a service pilot must do in carrying out his mission." Unquote. Susan, L. Blake, Susan L. Blake also refers to the former military practice in the US armed force of withholding from blacks the opportunity of to fly airplanes and observes. The protagonist in the story is a student at the Negro Air Force Air School at the skis established during World War II in response to complaints about discrimination against blacks in pilot training, the story about the school was that it trained black men to fly but never graduated them to com combat. Todd, the flyer in this story who feels he acquires dignity from his airplane and the appreciation of his white officers and shame from his relationship with ignorant black men has run into a budget and crushed into a white man's field." Unquote. Todd himself, when his mind drifts off from the crash site, recalls such discrimination mentioned in a letter he had received from his girlfriend back home. His girlfriend had warned him against his need for approval from the whites as it clouded his judgment. His girlfriend, whom he wanted to impress with his skills of flying, had referred to uh, in her last letter, Todd, I don't need to, I don't need the papers to tell me you had the intelligence to fly. And I have always known you to be a brave as anyone else. The papers uh, annoy me. Don't you be? Content to prove over and over again that you are a brave or a skillful just because you are black, taught, I think they keep beating that dead horse because they don't want to say why you why you boys are not yet fighting. I am really disappointed, Todd. Anyone with brain can learn to fly. But then what? What about using it? And who will tell you uh, see it for? I wish, dear, you would write about this. I sometimes think they are playing a trick on us. It's very humiliating. Perhaps he had tried to associate his achievement with the achievement of his race, which his girlfriend could not understand and appreciate 
but Todd knew that his white trainers never assigned his mistakes as the mistakes of an individual, but as the mistakes of the whole race, he reflects. What does she know of humiliation? She has never been down south. Now the humiliation would come when you must have uh, them judge you, knowing that they never accept your mistakes as your own, but hold it against your whole race that was humiliation. For Todd, the situation was all the more humiliating as he count, could, could never be simply himself in the presence of the old black ignorant man. Jefferson so to escape the humiliation of riding an ox to town, Todd tells Jefferson that he had orders not to leave the ship. Instead of identifying himself with the black Jefferson and his son, Todd identifies himself with a flying machine. I am naked without it. Only dignity I have. For him, the airplane was not a machine, but a suit of clothes, and it signified his identity. He wanted to get into the airplane and fly back. Uh, now, for him, any appreciation lay with his white officers. Todd trust his ability and efficiency and not his black identity. He believes that if he flies plane successfully, he would be elevated in the white world. As in Toni Morrison's uh, debut novel, Piccola Breed Love, you will find that how Piccola Breed Love longs for having a couple of blue eyes. Having a blue eye, a couple of blue eyes means that she will get accepted from the society. Simultaneously, Todd also thinks in the same way. So he does not go, he does not want to identify himself racially with Jefferson as a part of the black community. Referring to him, his wife's letter, he has already said, yes, and humiliation was one could never be simply yourself. When you were always a part of this black ignorant man, when Jefferson asked him why he wants to fly, Todd replies to himself, because it makes me less like you. And then he speaks aloud to Jefferson. It is as good a way to fly than and die as I know. Todd feels inferior in being a part of the black community where they are treated akin to prehistoric men. Meanwhile, Jefferson has been, has been waiting for Mr. Graves the owner of the field to arrive on the spot and take care of things. The airplane couched in the field like the abundant shell of a louse. Uh, Todd wishes to get into the airplane and fly back. Jefferson might assign his flying back to his being afraid of white officers, so he wants to, uh, so he wants to share his feelings with Jefferson. But he knows that the black people like Jefferson could not understand and appreciate his position and so he me, feels uh, Dr. Arya, I would like you to conclude it quickly because we have five other presentations set lined up for the session. Okay, okay. I am summarizing. Actually, in, in last Jefferson somehow made him able to understand that your treatment is very important. Forget about flying and other uh, uh, thing. And then he uh, then Jefferson, uh, sorry, Todd realized that, uh, that uh, if uh, I, I will fly in the, that condition, I would not be able to survive. So I should accept my black identity. I should ex uh, love it. As you find in Toni Morrison's uh, third novel, Song of Solomon, in last Milkman third, realized in the help of, with the help of Pilate that uh, his identity is more important and I, I should uh, be attached to my community. So that kind of gender solid, sorry, that kind of communal uh, feeling, com communal um, importance they understood after that, uh, the story ends. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I congratulate you. It's a very well-written and well-presented paper. Uh, it Thank presents you. a very sensitive light of the African-Americans who are caught between you know uh, these cultures they are born black but they aspire to be white in some ways so there's one question i would like to ask do you think that uh, hello mm -hmm. are you am i audible? 
Yeah, yeah, you are the one. Okay. So I just want to ask you one question. Uh, although it's amply clear in your paper, despite that, I mean, does white superiority actually feed on the economic insecurity of the black people as like, would you like, uh, or would you be agreeing or would you be like saying something? Else? Uh, uh, please repeat, uh, pardon. I'm saying that the white supremacy, does it feed on the economic insecurity of the black people? Yeah, that is the important uh, issue because uh, uh, financially they are uh, strong and they have to serve them. As two years ago, uh, George Floyd also faced that discrimination over there because he was uh, economically poor also. Okay. So it's not okay. only race, class is also very important. And despite that, despite being economically insecure or secure in their ways, they're earning well, they still feed the need of validation from the whites. Yeah. Get. George Floyd also says that. And Obama, in one of his interviews, also said, whenever, wherever, in any shop I go, they take care. If the blacks are considered the thief, the blacks are not trustworthy. So they follow me. They look at me. If any white man is uh, going in the inside the shop, they never follow. Thank you. That would be all for you. Thank you so much. It was a nice presentation. And now I would invite Dr. C. Alice Evangeline Jebiselvi, Professor of English from Sri Satyam College of Engineering and Technology, Selim, with her paper. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, I would uh, like to clarify at this point that we have five, uh, four presentations lined up and we'll be giving 10 minutes to each of the presentations. So please uh, like, take care of the time limit. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for introducing me. I'm Dr. Alice. I am from Salem. I'm working in Sri Satyam Engineering College. For uh, today's presentation, the topic I have selected is the Ghostly Brutality of Slavery, a Psychological Study of Toni Morrison's Beloved. Actually, this novel centers around the African-American literature. It is written by Toni Morrison, one of the famed writer of that country. So African-American literature is a study of literature that imposes importance on black people, their society and their culture and history. It gives writing of black writers who settled in America. Basically, there are themes centers around slavery, the struggle for freedom, and search for identity. African American literature reached its heights beginning of the 1970s. Many significant writers came to the mainstream at the beginning of the century. Toni Morrison, as a black writer, developed a love for literature and started her career with the novel The Bluest Eye in 1970. Her first novel itself created a tremendous sensation among the reading public. Some of her famous works are Songs of Solomon, Sula, Beloved, Jazz, and Tar Baby. Her novel Beloved awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 1988. It hits the society and became a critical success. Now let me pass to the main content of the uh, thesis paper. The Ghostly Brutality of Slavery. The main theme of Toni Morrison's Beloved dealt with the sufferings of slaves and especially the central character, Sede. She, Sede, I mean the central character, she was a slave and she was living in the sweet home, a place, a place named Sweet Home, where the slaves were intent to live in. So, she, uh, she was brutally uh, tormented by the masters. So, she escaped from that day and she started to lead a lonely life in 124 Bluestone Road, it is the name of the uh, place where she migrated after the sufferings of slavery. In this particular novel, Toni Morrison exemplified the cruelty of society through the central character Sedi. Slavery is bitter reality the black people experience is beyond imagination. Actually, sexual arrogance is a normal thing for them. Uh, even Sedi, the central character, she was tormented by the schoolmaster. He is actually the owner of Sede. And she still remembered the physical attack the master has imposed on her, the whipping he gave her, everything. Uh, at one at that point, a person named Paul D 
he came to see this particular uh, central character sedi and the, even the arrival of poldi reminded of her the terrifying past and the trauma of slavery because she wanted to live lo a lonely life in that particular 124 blue stone road so according to sedi she was the mother of four children according to her killing her daughter was a better option than making her doctor daughter another slave girl so because she was in the initial stage of her childhood itself she was branded a slave girl and she suffered a lot under the slavery tony morrison elaborately discussed the ill fate of slave women through the central character sedi sedi remembered how her mother worked day and night in the fields and one day when sedi's mother showed her the circle and cross burn in her chest it is the identity given to the slaves who is the real master so like that so it is the identity given to the slaves sedi's trauma not only started after the death of beloved actually he killed her own daughter beloved in order to make her to escape from the slavery so the after the death of beloved her uh, uh, it, it is not only started the slave system uh, her suffering her trauma it, it is not only started after the death of her daughter but in her early childhood itself so the slave women they were not given enough rights to raise their kid even after a certain period they were separated from their mother and taken as a property sedes loss got increased and when she lost her husband hali so actually hali also disappeared all on a sudden on a day and then she didn't know where he went but actually everyone knows very well she is not going he is not going to be alive after escaping from the sweet home settled in 124 blue stone road her problems increased when she witnessed her dead daughter's ghost in the uh, home 124 blue stone road actually tony morrison the uh, name of the house 124 blue stone road it is it itself is a symbolic representation of death because all the prior inmates of the house died due to one or another reason even sedi uh, sedi's family members they uh, she has a four sons no sedi's sons howard burglar and her mother in law everybody even denver they died or went away from the home for some reason sedi was affected psychologically due to the trauma of her past she did not want to remember her past sedi wanted to seclude herself from the world she wanted to repress her memories because she wanted to she just wanted to uh, not to reveal herself out to the world uh, she wanted to seclude herself because of her insecurities beloved the strange figure so throughout the novel the beloved is uh, exemplified as a uh, what you can tell it is like a ghost or else the repressed memory of sedi but actually it is a strange figure throughout the novel so and then Paul D and Beloved were treat, uh, actually uh, Paul D and Beloved the appearance of the ghost of Beloved were treated as interpretation for by Sede though the ghost Beloved haunted the house it helped Sede to forget her past memories so she wanted to forget her past memories in the hands of something she want, so she wanted to take the fear fear as an escapism the arrival of paul d to the house brought sede new light she saw the little son through him after a very long time paul d helped sede to come out of her of her fear even he threatened the ghost to stop it hazels sede was very happy when paul d took her to carnival uh, nearby why this carnival is very important is after a very long time 18 years after escaping from the sweet home she lived in 124 blue stone uh, house for a very long time and this carnival uh, has a very importance and tony morrison contrasted the uh, uh, scenes because after the very uh, scene of the carnival she is going to face some psychological problem and then this uh, actually when uh, because the arrival of stamp d he gave a uh, this paper cutting and uh, he told that uh, sede killed her daughter beloved and try to kill all her other children so uh, paul d who was the inmate of previous uh, home sweet home he was not able to take it uh, uh, take it to his heart and then he called sede a animal so an animal so this hurt sede more and more uh, psychologically the climax was portrayed by tony morrison as a bizarre psychology affectation of sede sede uh, who was uh, already affected both physically and mentally became weaker and weaker denver her daughter 
who understood the real condition of sede knocked lady jones bodwin for help they were the neighbors when the black community came to know about the ghost in 124 blue stone they came to the house about 30 women with the christian faith armed themselves and with the armlet they had given the ghost away from the house in the hands of slavery not only sede but her daughter also suffered because of the broken family because she didn't even know who her father was and sede her always she feared of sede because any moment she will kill me because already she killed her uh, uh, one daughter beloved and the ghost was haunting the house so denver her another daughter also having a fear about her mother tony morrison put forth the psychological affectation of her characters Sede is one of the characters who is repressed due to her past life in the system of slavery women were considered pleasure rendering machines sede felt that death was a kinder alternative to rape sede's mother was also a victim of such brutality she was gang raped and it was not only spoiled the psych physic of her but also tormented her mentally sede's mother got pregnant due to the gang rape and she implied it with the words taken up taken up she's uh, said his mother was continually taken up by the crew to satisfy the sexual thirst uh, as a conclusion tony morrison portrays the pathetic condition of female slaves in the novel beloved their sufferings is endless only death may be only consolation for them their life remained a complete disorder and there is no harmony at all said they did not find a world to live happily and she had uh, chosen loneliness she was always enslaved entangled and ensnared the condition of women deteriorated and they suffer from depression trauma anxiety and an inferiority complex tony morrison focused all uh, these psychological problems of enslaved women in the novel beloved thank you ma'am thank you dr alice uh, there is just one question i want your opinion on i mean was okay, the mother actually justified in killing beloved like she could yes, have let her Ab absolutely she is justifying because she thought that killing her daughter is better than making her to be a slave girl because already she know the cruelty of slavery again and again they were they were sexually uh, used and then they were like puppets in the hands of uh, their owners so she liked to kill beloved and all other uh, children also because even uh, the boy childs were treated as uh, working machines so uh, her intention is not to make her children slaves so it uh, she justifies her uh, opinion till the end of the novel okay but i have like you know we feel that sometimes you know it's a better alternative to live and struggle rather than die or rather than kill you know your children for it ah uh, yes ma'am but that time that period when tony morrison wrote that uh, that time the women they every day they were suffering suffering their suffering made them stone hearted and they felt that death is a better alternative but recent days uh, i can uh, tell that is after this feminism womanism they were ready to uh, suffer they are ready to suffer instead of uh, dying there is i see a hand raised by dr kavita Uh, Dr. Kavita, do you want to add something? Yeah, yeah. I would like to know. Okay, what is the symbol of uh, what is the meaning of that uh, tree which is Seth is having on her back? Oh, where, ma'am? Seth is having a tree on her back, and when so it, Baldi, uh, actually, uh, play, she wanted to. Uh, she was showing that uh, that tree to her, him. maybe that, that tree uh, symbolizes the life but actually it is not in the case of the novel because the tree it symbolizes life and uh, some uh, what we can say uh, in future she is going to have some life after the ghost was driven out she may be having some uh, something uh, more about that uh, life her uh, life it may be portrayed like that thank you she killed she killed beloved but she never cared about her uh, other daughter denver and her two sons also left the home she never bothered as a mother do, do you think that she was fail as a mother 
uh, actually the initial stage itself, itself when she killed when she tried to kill uh, bilavad she not only tried to kill bilavad also she threw her son on the wall and she tried to kill all her uh, children because uh, she came across all the uh, painful bitter past uh, because of slavery and as you told uh, dr kavita ma'am as you told it is not a motherly thing but uh, you know the condition of mothers uh, in the african american literature it is portrayed because uh, we may not understand we, we people of india india we are indians and we may not understand the sufferings of black people they are suffering recently only we have uh, recently we have seen how uh, uh, black man was uh, trampled by the policeman and how he was uh, uh, killed by the uh, policeman it became an issue so think of the current century current century also we have uh, this problem that is black and white racial discrimination on those days there is no social media sir there is no outcome nothing those people they were considered slaves so being a mother being a mother only uh, she is she killed the beloved and she ran away from the home and she thought that she is secured somewhat secured and she left her uh, sons and daughters as it is she didn't do her uh, role of a mother completely as you said kavita ma'am thank you dr alice thank you dr kavita thank you ma'am i think it thank was you kavita ma'am thank you nepali ma'am Uh, and thank you uh, and i'll now move on to the third paper for the day since we are running short of time we started late already so this paper is by dr mrina uh, m subhasini associate professor shri saraswati tyagaraj arts and science college polachi and her research scholar shri kritu it is de territorial de territorialization of transgender physical health issues and medical treatments Are we here, Dr. Subhasini? Please carry on. Dr. Subhasini. Is she here? Just let me check. I think she is not here. We'll move on to the next paper, which is by Dr. Jatinder Kaur, research scholar, GNA University, Fagwara, and Dr. Disha Khanna, who's supervising her. The title of the paper is "Molestation versus Intimacy in Aditi Rao's Work: A Kind of Freedom Song." Thank you, ma'am, and very warm welcome and uh, good morning, ma'am, from my side. Myself, uh, Stinder Kaur, a research scholar from ENE University, Fagwara, Punjab. So, my I am doing research work under the supervision of my supervisor, Dr. Disha Khanna. Ma'am, my present paper is on poet Aditi Rao's poetry work, a kind of freedom song, and its title is "Molestation uh, versus Intimacy in Aditi, Aditi Rao's Work: A Kind of Freedom Song." As we all know, that uh, we uh, women uh, molestation is uh, there uh, all over the world, uh, not especially in India. It's uh, in all over the world that. Uh, Uh, in a relationship, uh, whether it's marriage or a man-women relationship, then uh, a woman is physically and mentally molested, tortured, and tormented by a man. No doubt, things are being changed, but now uh, everything uh, is uh, depending upon uh, the you can say entire responsibility of a woman. my present research paper delves deep into the cultural identity and role of men women in indian society along with sexual violence and unwanted sex this paper is based on the poetical work a kind of freedom song of poetess aditi rao aditi rao writes on women issues uh, she writes on body politics and other things of feelings of women 
uh, we all know that when women is unhappy or crying but man doesn't care and he uses her in the hotel rooms where words don't exist only bodies speak i mean to say that a man in uh, uh, everywhere doesn't care about the feeling of a woman and that is used uh, we the women are used only for lust uh, research article of padma bhati dushale sangeeta re and sanjida arora named as women's experience of marital rape and sexual violence within marriage in india evidence from services reports this research paper puts a light on various issues of mental trauma uh, and presents bitter reality of married life in this article the criminal uh, law act of 2013 uh, uh, it has been mentioned that it was an amendment act of rape and sexual violence but in a marital relationship forced intercourse by the husband was left out in this so we can say that there are so many laws um, and acts uh, in our country and, uh, and in the entire world but sometimes uh, what is being done within the four walls of a home uh, nobody can know and even uh, women uh, don't think that they should uh, discuss it uh, openly in the uh, society in our indian society this is expected that the duty of a wife is always to make her husband happy and the index of husband's happiness involves the gratification of his sexual desires as well it never matters that a woman is happy or not the unwanted sexual as well as other social demands of the patriarchal world lead to the mental torture and trauma from for a woman when a man is going uh, to outside his home to earn uh, the money then this is always expected that women will prepare food for him and perform other household duties but but if a woman is going outside of her house for the same purpose then nobody is going to do all these duties for her and this is supposed that she can work for 24 hours and this is the responsibility of her to serve her family uh, from centuries we can say from centuries women are being crushed by men sometimes some incident are open for the society some are not uh, here i would discuss the recent indian women mandeep kaur who committed suicide in america due to domestic violence we all know that uh, she got married to ranjodh veer in 2015 and she was moved to america in 2018 uh, uh, she was used to beaten and tortured by her husband and then uh, then she committed suicide she was uh, having two daughters now the question is now the question is that who is responsible for her, for uh, her death and ruin of her daughter's life is this only her husband i think no this was the society the entire system uh, i have uh, many things to say but uh, i know that the time limit is only 10 minutes so i have to present uh, i have to highlight only uh, i mean to say uh, some few uh, important aspects there is another article of uh, nandini agarwal salma mam abdala and uh, grogri that uh, she, uh, they have written that marital rape and its impact on the mental health of women in india we all know that physical health is always affected by mental health and mental health that is uh, only uh, affected by the mental happiness mental satisfaction and emotional support from uh, her uh, uh, partner a person's life is always affected by his forcing style of a particular family we all know that the upbringing of a child is very 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 important in any family or in any society for example if a child bonds in a family that motivates him to adopt good human values then definitely that child will be equipped with good ethical values on the contrary imagine a child whose upbringing in a family where man uses his wife for lust only and don't respect her feelings and try to convince his male child to then what the child will learn definitely the male child if there is in the house he will learn that women are for use only and if there is a female child in the house she will learn that uh, i am a female that if this is being happening with my mother then this would be happen this can't be happen with me too so the things are that uh, 
some uh, uh, societal norms should be changed now. And then Aditi Rao writes in her poetic words, I am uh, presenting few of the poetical lines of her. There was once a woman who said so little, her voice fell asleep, her throat grew brittle. A man hid her lips under a white satin glove, kept her very quiet and called it true love. Her silence were never mean as a kettle. So we can see Sometimes women's voice is buried under a male's dominating style. He seduces her and doesn't allow her to speak the truth. In a clever way, man defines his physical seduction as a true love, but actually this is not. Aditi Rao presents the women in her real Indian position and portrays men as a true uh, image of patriarchal world. Men get pleasure from women's body and give us a name of affection, but in true sense, this is a false love. And in other words, we can say it is physical torture. Here I want to present Aditi Nao's another lines of her poetry. A sick yellow pressing me into a bed. I don't refuse to sleep in the fear of not satisfying, driving me. My hand can't refuse your chest hair. I refuse instead my own choking fear of your fingers. You can't hear me. Eventually fear learns to refuse me. Uh, this means that women can't say no to their husband, even they are having no sexual desires in domestic system. Women are used as a full time servant and then at night and as easily accessible. Uh, I should say that as a sex worker, this is not beginning being, being happening in every family or in every society, but sometimes it happens and only that woman knows what is the torture is. So female had no right of refusal because if she refuses, then it would be the cause of her destruction of her married life and her children would suffer. Then uh, the another political lines here, I want to quote, of uh, Aditi Rao, the bed on which your unmoving body is being sucked by man you had hope to love, he asked between tongue, if you are okay, you are not around to answer this. So uh, intimacy means an emotional bond of closeness between two persons who both are in a relationship. It always builds with time. No doubt when a man and women are comfortable to each other, then over time, intimacy takes a great shape of attachment between two persons and it includes physical touch or relations also, especially in the case of a male and female. But if a man is not committed to a woman and only tries to subjugate her, then it should be called a rape or molestation. Deeper bond of respect and affection always creates a sense of security in women. On the other hand, unwanted sex and sexual activity is one kind of abuse by the name of intimacy. Uh, uh, here I have some political lines and after that I'll try to conclude my paper. Now, Aditi Rao writes, she breaks easily over distance, over hours, bursting with the fear that nothing, no capacity for love can successfully maintain the distance between tight embrace and fear of dark spaces, constant denying fear of choking on things that smell like love, but are better held at a distance. So if I conclude my paper that unwanted sex is always associated with danger of mental and physical health as well. Forceful sex in marital life as well as in other, in any other man-women relationship is an offense. The resistance to it depends upon the inner sense, ethical social values and instincts of a female justice equality. And uh, it make a um, society a healthy society in all perspectives, but if very social, every social value is crushed under the pressure of traditions and customs, then how can we expect a healthy society? So self-reporting of women in police stations is very little in India because in cases of rapes and sexual abuses, police treats the women badly and society always blames to women only without analyzing other factors. So I am uh, concluding that again, I want to say that fostering of the child is very important because family history, circumstances, education and environment play its vital role in the development of a good and healthy personality. This research paper would be beneficial only if boys are reared with good human values and true meaning of equality is taught to them. 
new direction of thinking should be brought forward to rear the children then definitely this research will question the present social structure regarding women and acceptance of their liberty in real sense in all aspects of life girl children should be fostered in safe and secure home environment as it will create a sense of self confidence among the girl children right wrong and ethical values should be taught to both the sexes during childhood then definitely a healthy society will be created that's all from my side uh, respected academicians that's all thank you i really agree with you when you say that fostering is very important especially in case of men and i would like to add that it is equally important for us to treat our or you know to foster our women child or girl child in a way so that she is able to express herself more you know forcefully against yes, Yes, ma'am. Such kind of situations. Yes, so ma'am. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. We are like lagging time. We just have five to ten more minutes. So I would invite the last presenter for the day, uh, Dr. K. K. Mohanty, PhD scholar from Faculty of Arts, Communication, and Indic Studies, Sri Sri University, Katak, with his paper. Over to you, Dr. Mohanty. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. You are. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Honourable dignitary, Sharma Bhandari, ma'am, from the end of uh, Cap Comedy Trust. Jillian, so gratitude to you and other dignitaries for creating such a big platform for my paper presentation. Uh, respected participants, also, I am Mr. Kamalikant Mohanty, PhD scholar at Sri Sri University, Kotak. Uh, I have prepared uh, this paper. With the guidelines of uh, my PhD guide, Dr. Sarda Acharya. Thank you, ma'am. Now I am reading out my paper. The title of my paper is uh, a comparative study of two didactic poems, Henry Woodford Longfellow's A Sum of Life and Roald Dahl's Television. This paper aims at exploring the didactic message given in two poems, Henry Woodford Longfellow's A Sum of Life. And Roald Dahl's television. Moreover, it makes a beautiful comparison between the two poems from the point of view of didacticism and some other dimensions. A sum of life teaches the entire human beings about how to live a meaningful life, but television teaches the parents or guardians to uh, how to build the career of the children. A sum of life gives an instructional message to all human beings. Whereas television gives an instructional message to a particular group. These two poems are taken together because both the poems give some moral message related to life, and this aspect uh, of research is an undiscovered field of research. This dimension of research is undertaken with a view to inculcating a rational sense in people, with a view to, uh, 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 with regard to both the serious issues related to life. Analytical method is used to carry out the research in this field. The field of research is unquestioningly invaluable as it gives life-changing and career-transforming message. The term didactic has its origin in the ancient uh, Greek word didacticus, uh, which means after teaching. The term didacticus comes from deduction, meaning to teach. So something didactic teaches or instructs. A didactic poem generally instructs moral lesson providing knowledge of philosophy religion arts science or skills although some poets believe that all poetry is inherently instructional didactic poetry is separately refers to poems that contain a clear moral message or, or purpose to convey its readers oxford advanced learners dictionary of 7th edition gives the following meaning of the term didactic designed to teach people something especially a moral lesson. In a handbook of literary terms written by M. H. Abrams, the following words have been stated with regard to the term didactic and didactic literature. The adjective didactic, which means intended to give instruction, is applied to works of literature that are designed to expound a branch of knowledge or else to somebody in imaginative or fictional form, a moral, religious, or philosophical doctrine or theme. The writers of didactic literature choose to go down a more didactic path rather than focusing on the beauty of the words 
the storyline characters or the emotional impact of a piece of writing. The didactic view of art and poetry is, however, raised by those who favor the social purpose of art. Gibiso says, for art, for art's sake, I would not face the toil of writing a single line. Plato inaugurated the didactic poetry, theory of poetry. He pleaded for poetry that would sing the praises of gods and extol the virtues of heroes. For him, poetry should subverse, sub, subserve the social and moral purpose. John Milton's epi, Paradise Lost, Alexander Pope's uh, An Essay on Man, uh, William Black's A Divine Image, Rudyard Kipling's Eve, Alfred Lord Tennyson's In Memoriam, Henry Wordsworth Longfellow's A Sum of Life, Roald Dahl's Television, it is here, known as the best didactic poems. A Sum of Life is a didactic poem. The poet's central aim of the poem is to instruct about the art of living. The poem teaches the basic human values and lays out a foundation for a value-based life. The poem starts with a verb tale in an imperative manner to convey strong piece of instruction on what this life actually is and how it should be dealt with. The poet asks us not to tell him in sorrowful verses that life is hollow and a meaningless dream. Here Longfellow slams the pessimists who sing sad songs about life. According to the poet, a person who idles away time is like a dead person. Such worthless people often misguide others. He firmly says that life is not as insignificant as it looks like and it has much more value than we think of it. In this context, the poet says, tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Pessimists can do nothing due to their lack of spirit to do works. Like Longfellow, Gibiso also slums the pessimists. So says the following words in his famous novel, Pygmalion, with regard to the pessimistic sensibility. A pessimist is a man who thinks everybody as nasty as himself and hates them for it. A sense of pessimism is a big barrier in the way of the attainment of any goal. Charlie Chaplin, the world famous comedian, says the following words about the sense of pessimism. You will never find a rainbow if you are looking down. According to the poet, life is real and serious, not baseless or useless. So it should not be taken trivially. Grave is not the ultimate goal of life. Life doesn't end with death. Great works remain in this world even after, after death. He says that the biblical illusion dust, though art to dust to retarnished, you are made of dust and you will go back to dust after death, is only spoken of the body. It is never applicable to the soul. Hello. Any query, madam, ma'am? Yeah, actually, we are about to close, so I would like to, you know, you to so, cut off. Ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Okay, ma'am, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the concluding part, ma'am. Yes, thank uh, you, Yes, yes, uh, yes, I'm adhering to your uh, uh, guidelines, so I'm coming to the uh, concluding part. So here is the comparison. So within, ma'am, uh, will you allow me only two to three minutes so that I can conclude it? Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. A Sum of Life is a didactic poem written by an American poet, Henry Woodshot Longfellow, and television is a didactic poem written by a British poet, Roald Dahl. Both these poems are the didactic in nature, since both the poems give the instructional message related to life. A Sum of Life gives instructionally philosophical message, whereas television gives instructionally psychological message. A Sum of Life can be considered from philosophical perspectives and uh, the poem, as the poem highlights the philosophy of life, and television can be considered from the psychological perspective because it is related to the growth and development of child's mind. A sum of life gives the instruction to entire mankind about how to live meaningful life, but television gives instruction to parents careless about how to build the career of the children. A sum of life slams the pessimists who say that life is an empty dream. Television slams the careless parents. Uh, who allow their children to enjoy different programs on television. A sum of life gives a hint about the divine existence, but there is no such hint of divinity in television. A sum of life gives a message about the transformation of life. Television gives a message about the trans transformation of life as well as the dangerous consequence if disobeyed the rules.
a sum of light casts light on an illusion from the bible dust do art to dust the return is in order to highlight the fragility of human bodies after death there are a number of allusions in television the poet refers to other uh, author other authors works and characters like Penny Love, Squirrel, Pigling, Mr. TV, Winkle, it is without openly acknowledging them. Some of life belongs to the genre of Carpe Diem because the poet lays emphasis on the present time, but television doesn't belong to the genre, this genre, because the poet here lays emphasis on both present, past and future. In television, the poet lays emphasis on the avoidance of entertainment in the lives of kids for the betterment of their career, but in a sum of life, the poet lays emphasis on the avoidance of enjoyment and sorrow for making life meaningful. Dahl wants to warn us against the excessive watching of television and then suggest the better alternative in the form of reading books through this poem. And uh, the capitalization helps him express his views more emphatically. Henry Woodshot Longfellow uses the different instances from Bible, history, philosophy, in order, in order to make the masses more focusing and forceful. In a sum of life, the poet uses the literary device anaphora to lay emphasis on the human action, act, act in the living present. In television, the literary device anaphora to lay emphasis on reading, they read and read and read and read. In both poems, there are the uses of polysyndeton to lay emphasis on the respective ideas. Uh, both the poems end with the note of optimism in a sum of life, the poet is hopeful that the human beings will work diligently and sincerely, keeping faith on the Almighty. In television, the poet is hopeful that the mm -hmm. children will boycott the television and will start reading. Uh, and uh, the last only five lines I'm reading out so that my paper will be presentation will be concluded. There is a note of didacticism in both a sum of life and television. These poems give the invaluable message about the transformation of life. The central theme of the poem is that the poet wishes to spread the message that TV is uh, harmful for the young minds as they corrupt the children's mind and make them unimaginative. The poet outrightly says that the children should not be allowed anywhere near your television set. A sum of life is known for its optimism and the theme of right attitude to life. The poet gives out the message that pleasure and sorrow is not the goal of life. The purpose of the life is to carry out all duties and responsibilities for the well-being of all. Both the poems are unique in their respective fields in giving the uh, ethical message for the enlightenment of human life. Thank you, ma'am, for giving me a chance to read out the paper. Uh, thank you. Thank you, and it was a nice paper. It ended the session on a very positive note. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, it was for the paucity of time that we could not, you know, delve deeper in the all the beautiful papers oh, okay, that we okay. in the session. Okay, ma'am. Okay, okay ma'am. Thank you. No problem. I wish you all the best in your all academic endeavors for the future.